Weapons are arguably the most important technology that humans have ever created. Humans, compared to many animals, are weak and fragile, but with the invention of weapons, we were able to kill the biggest animals in the world. In today's video, we'll take a look at the evolution of weapons and their involvement in warfare and hunting. Please enjoy. To begin with, we must go back to some of our most primitive ancestors. Chimpanzees in today's world have been observed over 20 times sharpening sticks with their teeth to make a spear. They were then observed stabbing a bush baby's nest to injure the animal and then finally killing it with the hands or teeth. I'll link a video of a chimp doing this here. This could point towards ancient humans using very primitive forms of weaponry like sharpened sticks to impale and injure animals. However, we're unlikely to find evidence of this, as wooden sticks are extremely unlikely to preserve. When we come forwards in time to 2.6 million years ago, we can see evidence of early Stone Age tools. These are called Older One tools. Older One tools include hammer stones, stone cores and sharpened stone flakes. Although these tools have primary uses, it's not unlikely that they could have been used as weapons. By about 1.76 million years ago, early humans began to use Achillean hand axes and other large cutting tools, which could have also been used as weapons. If you'd like to know more about ancient stone tools, then I have a video here that goes into more detail. Even though our ancestors had entered the Stone Age, it is evident that they continue to use wood tools. A site in Schöningen, Germany is home to one of possibly the earliest forms of weaponry. The newly found throwing stick originates from the best known of the sites, Schöningen 13 from which well-preserved throwing spears, a push lance, and wooden tools of unknown function were unearthed in the 1990s. The tool was carefully carved from the branch or stem of a spruce tree, the same wood used for 10 out of the 11 artefacts recovered from the site. The stick also showed signs of wear, typical of such a weapon. There are also obvious signs of the crafter cutting the stick and then smoothing over with stone tools. Archaeologists hypothesise that hominins who lived in Schöningen used the weapon to hunt birds, smaller game, or to hit and injure larger game such as horses. The tool could have also been used to herd large animals in a specific direction for subsequent killing at closer ranges with throwing or thrusting spears. A study was conducted with six javelin athletes who were recruited to test whether the spears could be used to hit a target at a distance using replicas made by hand. Javelin athletes were chosen for the study because they had the skill to throw at high velocity, matching the capability of a hominin hunter. The javelin athletes demonstrated that the target could be hit from up to 20 metres away and with significant impact, which would translate into a kill against prey. The weight of the Schöningen spears previously led scientists to believe that they would struggle to travel at a significant speed. However, the study shows that the balance of weight and speed at which the athletes could throw them produces enough kinetic energy to hit and kill a target. The crafters of the spears are a debated topic. Homo heidelbergensis is one hominin that is suggested, as well as Neanderthals. Stone tips are one of the earliest forms of obvious weaponry, with the earliest surviving example of stone tips with animal blood dating to 64,000 years ago from Natal in what is now South Africa. These early weapons were just a stone tip, which is advantageous over organic materials, because it enables weapons to cut through tougher hides and create larger wounds, killing more easily. There is yet no direct evidence for bows during the African Pleistocene, and the hypothesis that very early stone points were used for tip darts or arrows remains unsupported by studies and contextual evidence. However, it is still plausible that humans used these as arrowheads and did in fact have some form of early bow. The earliest confirmed arrowheads found outside of Africa were discovered in 2020 in Fahayan Cave, Sri Lanka. They have been dated to 48,000 years ago. Bow and arrow hunting at the Sri Lankan site likely focused on monkeys and smaller animals such as squirrels. Remains of these creatures were found in the same sediment as the bone points. Poison may have been used on the tips of the arrowheads to slow down or kill the target, much like we see in modern hunter-gatherer society. 
The oldest complete bow to be excavated is at Starkar and is 10 to 11,000 years old. Measuring 1.4 meters long, carved from a willow sapling about 70 mil wide. Although the bowstring did not survive, archaeologists know that it must have been made of either animal or plant fibers. Probably either rawhide made from animal skins or string made from tree bark. The bow would have shot wooden arrows tipped with flint, bone or antler points. Archaeologists carried out a modern experiment to recreate a willow bow the same size and shape as the one excavated at the site. It took about one and a half hours to make a bow that could shoot an arrow tipped with a barbed point 25 meters along the ground or 15 meters straight up into the air. They used it to shoot an arrow through a dead fish in the water and to shoot an arrow so far into a tree that they could not get it back out again. It's safe to say that these bows could have been used to hunt small game, fish and birds. Bow and arrows were a game changer for our species, as they allowed our ancestors to kill and injure prey from long distances, minimising risk of injury to themselves and even avoiding detection. The bow and arrow would have also been used in warfare, with the development of the longbow spreading all over Europe, easily piercing a soldier's armour from up to 250 metres away. Also, the Mongolian recurve bow is considered one of the deadliest ancient bows, being able to shoot up to 500 metres away while on horseback, and being able to accurately hit targets 300 metres away when shot by a skilled Mongolian archer. The ability to combine range with the mobility and speed of a horse was revolutionary for human warfare, and is one of the many reasons the Mongolian Empire was able to defeat so many armies. In order to get an idea of where large-scale warfare began and what weapons were being used, we need to talk about some of the first ancient civilizations. The ancient Sumerians, the first known civilization, often found themselves defending against barbarian tribes. Sumerian soldiers were armed with spears, maces, swords, clubs and slings. They also manned chariots on which they used spears and bows. Egypt was considered to be peaceful in the ancient world. They never considered training an army for the sake of invasion or defence of their own province. During the 15th dynasty, a tribe known as the Hyksos surprised the Egyptians when they marched into Egypt in the Second Intermediate Period with chariots. At this time, weapons superior to those possessed by the Egyptians were being developed further away in Asia. Tribes using these new and sophisticated weapons started to conquer new lands and at the same time exchange their knowledge of weapons with other civilizations. The Hyksos were among these invaders. Many historians believe that the Hyksos came from Mesopotamia, although the exact location is still a mystery. The invaders used composite bows, as well as improved recurve bows and arrowheads. Unlike the Sumerians, they had horse-drawn chariots and not donkeys, and wore mail shirts and metal helmets. They were also armed with superior daggers and swords. Before the Hyksos invasion, the Egyptians did not have a cavalry, this is because it is believed that their small horses were not strong enough to support the rider. It was from the Hyksos charioteers that the use of horses in warfare was introduced to the Egyptian culture. When, after a civil war of the Hyksos rulers, the Egyptians came back into power once again, they continued to use horse-drawn chariots in their armies. This can be seen in the Battle of Kadesh, which saw the largest chariot battle in recorded history take place. Led by Ramesses II, the Egyptian army consisted of between 20 and 40,000 men and 3 to 4,000 chariots. On the Hittite side, King Muwatili II had mustered several of his allies. Ramesses II recorded a long list of 19 Hittite allies brought to Kadesh by Muwatili. The Hittite army consisted of around 40,000 men and 3,000 chariots. This battle is also very famous because both sides claimed victory, which led to the world's first peace treaty. Assyria was a northern Mesopotamian kingdom known for its warlike culture. It was King Shamshi Adad at the start of the 18th century BC who conquered lands to the west as far as the Mediterranean and established the first Assyrian Empire. They had set up schools to teach military warfare involving the demolition of walls. The Assyrians were surrounded by hostile, powerful and aggressive tribes, therefore it was important for them to train their people. The Assyrian army was the first to use iron in its weapons. Many variants of spears, bows, axes and swords were made throughout our history, 
as well as many different siege weapons such as catapults, battering rams, burning oil, trebuchets and ballistas. I won't go into much detail on these. We are now way past the invention of weapons that were used and designed with solely hunting in mind. Arguably one of the biggest landmarks in the invention of weapons was the discovery of black powder, or most commonly known as gunpowder. Gunpowder was invented in China sometime during the first millennium AD. The earliest possible reference to gunpowder appeared in 142 AD during the Eastern Han Dynasty when the alchemist Wai Boyang, also known as the father of alchemy, wrote about a substance with gunpowder-like properties. He described a mixture of three powders that would fly and dance violently in his Canton Chi, otherwise known as the Book of Three Kinships. It's a text based off the subject of alchemy. Although he did not name the powders, they were almost certainly the ingredients of gunpowder, and no other explosive known to scientists is composed of three powders. The earliest surviving chemical formula of gunpowder dates to 1044, and it's written in the military manual Wu Yang Zhong Yu, also known in English as the Complete Essentials for the Military Classics, which contains a collection of facts on Chinese weaponry. However, the 1044 edition has since been lost, and the only currently extant copy is dated to 1510 during the Ming Dynasty. The most dominant weapon types were gunpowder arrows, bombs, and guns. The manual also included unrealistic weapon ideas, but there is no evidence that these weapons were ever deployed. The early gunpowder formula contained too little saltpetre to be explosive, but the mixture was highly flammable and contemporary weapons reflected this in their deployment as mainly shock and incendiary weapons. One of the first, if not the first, of these weapons was the fire arrow. The first possible reference to the use of fire arrows was by the Southern Wu in 904, during the Siege of Yuzhang. An officer under Yang Jingmi by the name of Jing Fen ordered his troops to shoot off a machine to burn the Longsha Gate after which he and his troops dashed over the fire into the city and captured it. Early gunpowder may have only produced an effective flame when exposed to oxygen, meaning the rush of air around the arrow in flight would have provided a suitably ample supply of reactants for the reaction. Production of gunpowder and fire arrows heavily increased in the 11th century as the court centralised the production process, constructing large gunpowder production facilities, hiring carpenters and tanners for the military production in the capital of Kaifeng. One surviving source, around 1023, lists all the workers working in Kaifeng, while another notes that in 1083, the imperial court sent 100,000 gunpowder arrows to one garrison and 250,000 to another. The first fire arrows were the arrows strapped to gunpowder incendiaries, but they eventually became gunpowder propelled projectiles, or commonly known as rockets. According to the history of Song, in 969, two Song generals, Yue Yifang, and Fang Jishang invented a variant of fire arrow which used gunpowder tubes as propellants. These fire arrows were shown to the emperor in 970, when the head of a weapons manufacturing bureau sent Fang Jishang to demonstrate the gunpowder arrow design, for which he was heavily rewarded. There is only slight evidence that rockets existed prior to the year 1200, and it is more likely that they were not used or produced for warfare until the latter half of the 13th century. Some historians argue that rockets could not have existed before the 12th century, since the gunpowder formulas listed in the Wuyang Jinyu are not suitable as rocket propellants. Rockets are recorded to have been used by the Song Navy in a military exercise dated to 1245. The fire lance was a gunpowder weapon and the ancestor of modern firearms. The first appeared in 10th to 12th century China and was used to great effect during the Jin Song Wars. It began as a small pyrotechnic device attached to a polearm weapon, used to gain a shock advantage at the start of melee. As gunpowder improved, the explosive discharge was increased, and debris or pellets added, giving it some of the effects of a combination modern flamethrower and a shotgun, but with very short range of only 10 feet and only one shot. By the late 13th century, fire lance barrels had transitioned to metal materials to better withstand the explosive blast and the lance point was discarded in favour of relying solely on the gunpowder blast, these became the first hand cannons. Although the early fire lance was considered to be the ancestor of firearms, it is not considered a true gun because it did not include projectiles, whereas a gun by definition uses 
the explosive force of gunpowder to propel a projectile from a tube. Cannons, muskets and pistols are a typical example. Even later on when shrapnel such as ceramics and bits of iron were added to the fire lance, they didn't close up the barrel and were only swept along with the discharge rather than making use of windage, and so they are referred to as coviatives. In 1259, a type of fire-emitting lance made an appearance, and according to the history of Song, quote, it is made from a large bamboo tube, and inside is stuffed a pellet wad. Once the fire goes off, it completely spews the rear pellet wad forth. The pellet wad mentioned is possibly the first true bullet in recorded history, depending on how bullet is defined, as it did occlude the barrel, unlike previous coviatives used in the fire lance. Archaeological samples of the oldest gun, specifically the hand cannon, have been dated starting from the 13th century. The oldest extant gun whose dating is unequivocal is the Xanadu gun, because it contains an inscription describing its date of manufacturing, which is 1298. It is called the Xanadu gun because it was discovered in the ruins of Xanadu, the Mongolian summer palace in Inner Mongolia. The Xanadu gun is 34.7cm in length and weighs 6.2kg. The design of the gun includes axle holes in its rear, which some speculate could have been used in a mounting mechanism. Although the Xanadu gun is the most precisely dated gun from the 13th century, other extant examples with approximate dating likely predate it. The Mongolian Empire would later use some of these weapons in their invasion of Europe and Japan after the complete conquest of the Jin Dynasty in 1234. It's likely that hunters still used bows, arrows and traps to kill animals around this time, as guns were still inaccurate and produced a strong smell. Medieval weapons continued to be used during the Renaissance, such as the Islamic gunpowder empires and the English Civil War. These weapons included the Gizam, halberd, sword, mace and partisan. The sword remained the most popular weapon during the Renaissance, however it underwent many changes. Various extensions were added, designed to protect the hands of its owner. The two-handed sword was widely used in Western Europe, being deployed by both the rich and the poor. The armies during this period were usually equipped with double-edged swords, halberds, arquebuses, crossbows and improvised axes. An arquebus is a form of long gun that appeared in Europe and the Ottoman Empire during the 15th century. In their earliest form, these guns were defensive weapons mounted on the German city walls in the early 15th century. The addition of a shoulder stock, priming pan and matchlock mechanism in the late 15th century turned the arquebus into a handheld firearm and also the first firearm equipped with a trigger. The exact date of the matchlock mechanism's appearance is disputed. It could have appeared in the Ottoman Empire as early as 1465 and in Europe a little before 1475. The heavy arquebus, which was then called a musket, was developed to better penetrate plate armour and appeared in Europe around 1521. The musket, essentially a large arquebus, was introduced around 1521, but fell out of favour in the mid-16th century due to the decline of armour. The tomb, however, remained, and musket became a generic descriptor for gunpowder weapons fired from the shoulder into the 1800s. Musket and arquebus were used interchangeably and referred to the same weapon, and even referred to as an arquebus musket. Hunters would have started to use guns to hunt animals, as they became more reliable, accurate, and could fire more than one shot before they had to be cleaned. In 1593, cannons were used most effectively in the siege of Pyongyang. Ming warriors made cannons to fight the Japanese. The battle was won by the Ming warriors because the Japanese lacked cannons or any sort of gunpowder weapons. During the Siege of Constantinople in 1453, Mohammed the Conqueror, Sultan of Turkey, ordered his Hungarian engineer, Urban, to develop the biggest gun ever seen. Once the huge guns, cannons or bombards were in position, the walls of Constantinople came tumbling down. The introduction of such bombards had a massive effect on the European society. Engineers started to design their walls, keeping in mind the danger the walls could face when fighting against newly introduced bombards. The use of the bayonet, beginning in the 17th century, allowed soldiers to use muskets as pikes in close combat. The flintlock, invented slightly earlier, made firearms more reliable. Cartridges were also invented around this time, and made existing firearms easier to load. 
The earliest successful utilization of metan cylinder rocket artillery is associated with the Kingdom of Mysore in South India. Tipu Sultan's father, Hyder Ali, successfully established the powerful Sultanate of Mysore and introduced the first iron cast metal cylinder rocket. Mysorean rockets of this period were innovative because of the use of iron tubes that tightly packed the gunpowder propellant. This enabled higher thrust and longer range for the missile. Tipu Sultan also used them against the larger forces of the East India Company during the anglo mysore Wars, especially during the Battle of Polalu. Another battle where these missiles were deployed was the Battle of Sultan Pet Tope, where Colonel Arthur Wellesley, later famous as the first Duke of Wellington, was almost defeated by Tipu's Divan Prunea. Although the rockets were quite primitive, they had a demoralizing effect on the enemy due to the noise and bursting light. The rocket could be of various sizes, but usually consisted of a tube of soft hammered iron, about 8 inches long, and 1.5 to 3 inches in diameter, closed at one end and strapped to the shaft of bamboo, about 4 foot long. The iron tube acted as a combustion chamber and contained well-packaged black powder propellant. A rocket carrying about one pound of powder could travel almost 900 meters. In 1803, the British began using shrapnel. Shrapnel shells were anti-personnel artillery munitions which carried many individual bullets close to a target's area and then ejected them to allow them to continue along the shell's trajectory and strike targets individually. As well as these advantages in firearms and artillery technology, new repeating firearms began to emerge on the battlefield. As soon as matchlocks appeared, there were attempts to create non-muzzle loading firearms. Early attempts, such as the Ferguson rifle, proved to be too difficult for regular soldiers. By 1836, a German gunsmith invented the Drace needle rifle, the first bolt action rifle, which the Prussian army adopted in 1848. In 1866, during the Austro-Prussian War, after the decisive Prussian victory at the Battle of Königgrätz, it was obvious that the muzzle-loading rifles were ineffective in battle. Soon after, nations all around Europe began adopting breech loaders and converting their existing service rifles. Such rifles include the British Snyder rifle and the French Chasspot rifle. These new rifles, along with the invention of the revolver, displayed the need for the way battles were fought to change. However, it was only until the First World War that military leaders around the world adopted new tactics to employ these weapons. Around this time, new weapons were being made with the sole purpose of hunting. As Europeans made inroads into Africa in the early 19th century, guns were developed to handle the very large game encountered. This was for self-protection, food gathering and sport. The first guns were the simple muzzle-loading shotgun designs, already used for birds and loading with softballs of lead for use on large game. Due to their ineffectiveness on the largest game, up to 35 shots being recorded by some riders for a single elephant, they soon developed into larger calibre, black powder, smoothbores. These very large and very heavy firearms were the first to be known as elephant guns of the black powder era. Their use also included all thick-skinned dangerous game such as rhinos, hippopotamuses and cape buffalo. During World War I, both the British and the Germans deployed elephant guns obtained from their African colonies in an attempt to break the stalemate in the trenches. The British used elephant guns as a means of countering the German tactic of having their snipers advance towards allied lines under the cover of a 6-10mm to 10 millimeter thick steel plate. Though normal small firearms were ineffective against the plate, the elephant guns of the era had enough force to punch through it. The 20th century saw a large increase in weapon innovation, but also the ability to affect the entire planet. Large-scale chemical weapons were first used on the battlefield in World War I, starting from 1914, despite existing international conventions that prohibited the use of such weapons. In 1915, the first propeller plane that could safely fire a machine gun through the propeller blades was invented. This led to later dogfights during World War I. Tanks were also used for the first time during World War I, but they were too often slow and unreliable. They did allow more mobility in the war. Early tanks were mounted with machine guns and light artillery. Armoured vehicles with wheels had been used earlier, but they could not cross trenches. Tanks were used a lot more and in greater numbers in World War II. The first weapon designed to be guided to its target is the German Fritz X anti-ship bomb. 
Ever since, more and more armed forces adopted weapons that are guided by electronics and human assistance for a wide range of purposes. The first weapon confirmed to reach outer space were the German V-2 rockets in 1944, which were also the first long-range ballistic missiles. V-2 rockets also led to the space race and eventually the Apollo 11 moon landing. The first atomic bombs were tested and used in warfare in 1945. No nuclear weapons have been used in warfare since, due to the added risk of nuclear holocaust. They remain the most powerful man-made weapons ever built. We are now at the stage where we are capable of causing the extinction of our own race, as well as killing millions of people in a matter of minutes. The first weapons designed to attack targets in space were developed by the Soviet Union and the United States during the Cold War, particularly the anti-satellite missile. The 21st century saw the increase of guided missiles to reduce the risk of soldier fatalities and to increase effectiveness. The first practical laser weapon, called the Laser Weapon System, was built by the United States Navy and installed on the USS Ponce. It is designed to destroy fast and small targets such as simple incoming missiles and drones at a very short distance. We have also taken primitive weapons like the bow and crossbow and modernised them. The compound bow, built with modern materials, is able to store more energy in the arms of the bow as the cable is drawn back, meaning that it is much more powerful when released, sending the arrow out with more force and greater distance. Also, modern designs and materials of arrows are much better than earlier forms as they are weighed more at the front, making it fly easier and more accurately. Us humans now have such a great power in this world. We have the ability to cause a global extinction event and as time goes on, we will only become more dangerous to ourselves and the rest of the life on Earth, and maybe, in the distant future, life on other planets in the universe. Thanks for watching today's video. If you like this sort of content and want to see more, then please like and subscribe. Also, don't forget to comment any video suggestions below. Thank you.